You're listening to Solera Innovation Labs, where automotive experts from around the world discuss technology trends and mobility and debate tomorrow's rules of the road. Whether you're a technician, a dealer, an appraiser, a car lover, or anything in between, we'll discuss topics that will keep you up to date and help you and your business win. So I'm going to welcome everyone back to Don's Drive-In. Today, we have Brandon Eckerod from the Collision Repair Education Foundation with us. And we're going to be talking a lot about what that foundation does, where it's going, how it started, and, and what kind of impact it's having on the industry. But let's transition a little bit more into to you, Brandon. And, and let's talk about, first of all, what is the Collision Educa- Repair Education Foundation, also known as CREF? So I think for any of the listeners, we'll probably start to refer to it as CREF. It's the acronym uh, for it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the, the foundation and what it is, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how your what your role is and, and how you've kind of evolved with inside that organization. Welcome to Solar Innovation Lab, Brandon. So we welcome you to, and, and our section that you're on today is, is Don's Driving, right? So there, there you go. So take it away, Brandon. Tell us a little bit about CREP. Well, first of all, thank you, Don, for, for having me on and allowing me the chance to kind of help. Uh, for some people, it might be an introduction. For others, they, who might be already supporting us. Um, you know, any anytime we get the chance to kind of spread the word about what we're doing is a good thing. So, again, thank you for your participation and Solaris continued support. So, always appreciate that. But the, the Collision Repair Education Foundation is the collision industry's national 501c3 charity that supports high school and college collision school programs, instructors, and students. So this is anything from a high school shop program to a technical school and college, a community college, uh, you know, the for-profit schools like Lincoln Tech, UTI, um, they are all under our umbrella of support. And what we do as a, a charitable organization. Well, and Brandon, is- I'm going to say this because I think our, our viewers or listeners don't know this. How, how many of those organizations are really out there when you start talking about the high it sounds It sounds enormous, right? But how, how, how large or finite is it? So when we started this philanthropic focus back in 2009, we've actually been around since 91. I can give some background on that. But in 2009, there were roughly about 1,400 collision programs, meaning high school or colleges within the country, according to our data and research. That number has now dwindled down to less, less than 1,000. So Holy cow. starting to close. Yep. And the, the need for these entry-level technicians and or other staff has only grown. So the fact that there's less and less schools um, is, is an issue, and that's what we're trying to tackle with the industry support. And, it, you know, it sounds underwhelming now all of a sudden. When you, when you first start talking about the high schools and, you know, the, the college-type programs, you go, okay, wow, you know, a ton of high schools. And but when you go back and say there's roughly a 1,000 places here trying to train, you know, the, the next generation of technicians for collision, that it almost sounds sad. Am I safe in saying those things? I mean, is it – right? It is. And, you know, there's, there are some programs out there that might be more so like hobby shop type of programs. And we're, we're not necessarily interested in focusing on those programs because we're, we want to spend more of our focus, time and energy and our supporters dollars and, you know, donations into those programs, um, that are serious about a technical education to get these students ready for entry level employment. So that roughly about a thousand, you know, high school and college collision programs, which is pretty much a 50 50 split between high schools and colleges. That equates to roughly about between 40 and 50,000 students in the educational pipeline each year. Um, for what you know, under some schools call it collision repair, some schools call it auto body. Um, and this is separate from mechanical. So, mechanical auto service, they're okay. not necessarily under our umbrella of support, but we've got new initiatives that are now including those types of students to get them introduced to you know, opportunities within our industry. Well, I mean, all right. So let's you, you see, ask yourself this question, right? High school, um, when I, you know, as I went to school, uh, for some reason, it, people felt, or at least there's this, I don't know, shadow, if you will, that the students that go down into more of the vocational type stuff are, are not the students that are going to be the ones that are great in business or going to be perfect for your career. I, Tell me a little bit about that, because I think I think it's, it's a total farce, right? Yep. But tell me when you look at the number of students that are out there, are they are, are this where administrators are just kind of dumping kids? That's absolutely true, and and what we hear um, and what we know because we get feedback from both the students and instructors is that you know you have the school administrators and more so 
school counselors. Um, they are playing gatekeepers to, you know, there's been this for quite some time now. There's been this continuous push that you have to go to college for your college to be successful in life. Uh, and this has been going on for quite some time. And what they view, not just the collision program, it's kind of really any technical field. They view those programs as more or less, like you said, dumping grounds. So, you know, I've got a bad kid, no, no, you know, uh, chance that they might be going to maybe a four-year college. The school counselor will just say, you know, just go down to shop class, get out of my hair and just sit down there until you graduate. And then I'm done with you. Well, when we go to present to administrators and attend things like the National School Counselor Conference, I get up in front of that group and say that quote unquote bad kid that you're sending down to shop class is the same bad kid that is going to be repairing your family's car after an accident that you're entrusting. <laughs> <laughs> you better care about yeah. more so than anybody else because you're, you know, and they don't have a mountain of student debt like these other students that you're sending to four year college. And there's more job prospects than there are people to fill them. So we're trying to re educate that group. Um, and it starts with parents, it starts with counselors. And unfortunately, it also starts, you know, we've been told you have to start with these students at the elementary school age because some schools in some markets, they are dictating to their students that by the time they're getting through junior high, they have to pick a career path. Now, I don't know about you, Don, but when I was in junior high, I, I didn't know much. And, you know, my, my career aspirations were probably pretty limited, but that's when those students are being told you got to pick something. So, oh, yeah. to, you know, help get that in front of the, in front of them at that early age. But it's, it's interesting you say a lot of these things. So, so I come from a family of educators, my, both my parents, uh, and they were divorced and remarried educators as well. So I come from that high school education type of scenario, right? Um, and one of them ran a vocational center. So he's the, uh, we'll call it the principal, if you will, um, of, of the vocational center. So you hear a lot of these kind of things. But, you know, it's funny when I coach hockey and I coach high school hockey, you're right. These kids are challenged with, what am I supposed to go do with the rest of my life when I'm 16, 17, and 18? You know, it, it's really difficult for these guys to go do. So when you start looking at craft and what you guys have done, so let's talk about, you know, there's this huge need, right? So one of the things that you guys, and I said it in the news, and, and this kind of ties us back into the conversation. We can get more detail in there. But in the news, you guys worked with, with ICAR to release a snapshot survey of the industry and, and really where it stands with the number of technicians. And in short story, and you can talk a little bit more about it, but the short comment is, is it looks like on the average, right, with turnover in the industry, that we need roughly about 14,000 technicians for collision only every year. Now, you just mentioned the fact that with these thousand schools that we have roughly 50,000 students or a pool potentially to kind of get out of there, but yet we still have this huge gap in the industry. Am I fair in saying that? Absolutely. And that 50,000 that I mentioned, I mean, that is, again, starting off in high school or starting off in college. So that is not 50,000 that are ready for employment day one. Um, but what that snapshot does is we basically reach out to the industry to try to gather data to help showcase and be able to, you know, present the need that's out there. That, that snapshot showcases and anybody within the industry um, would agree to this. If, if I stand in front of a group of industry professionals at a conference, you know, I ask if how many of you would agree that the number one issue probably that this industry is facing is one, a need for entry level staff and two, the industry is aging in terms of the workforce. And I would, you know, almost guarantee everyone's hands going to go up because from that data and that snapshot, you see that we're now into the it's early to mid 40s. Some would argue in some you know markets that it's even closer to 50. So this industry workforce is aging. The need is even greater, and what's the re what's going to be the result if we don't fix this is that, mostly like what I just said, that to be able to fix vehicles, you know, it might not be a month or so that you can get your vehicle fixed after an accident because we just don't have the people. And it's right. not just on the technician side. I mean, there is, as what we showcase in our career fairs that I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, it's all these different career paths and different types of companies who are all hurting for people. So students, can, they need to be able to see that you can work on cars, you can go work for a paint company, tool company, vehicle manufacturer, rental car company, lots of different career paths available to them, and they are very good paying jobs as long as the students are willing to put in the work. Yeah, and so let's talk about a couple of things that are in your, your snapshot that I think is kind of interesting. And, and, and look, for the people listening, um, one of the things that you guys did is when you look at the 2019 national income average, a collision, the average collision repair tech nationally, is making about fifty four, almost fifty five thousand dollars a year, right? Yep. But when you start going looking at a, a 
a chemical technician or a carpenter. Let's just go to the carpenter. So the kid that, ah, I don't want to work on cars. I'm just going to go build houses, right? If you can get in there, the average income for them is 51000 right? So if I'm just a welder or a truck driver, right? We need heavy-duty truck drivers as well, but the average income for them is about $45,000. So you guys actually put the statistics there that show out of a lot of the trades that are out there, that if you get in the collision repair and, and become a successful technician, your average income is higher than the other skilled trades. Is that fair? Absolutely. And what we have to, um, when we have these career fair events where we have time in front of students, you know, we have to be real with them and kind of level the, you know, the, the mindset is, you know, if you wanted to walking out of this room and go work for Starbucks, for example, you could probably start off making more working at Starbucks than, you know, going to work at a very entry level in a, a shop or something like that. But for those that are willing to put in the work, continue education, training, things like that, five years from now, you could easily be making six figures. Most yeah, there's, like, no, there's no career path in those other ones. Where in, in the collision space, what you're saying is that there's a career path to go from being a entry-level technician to a master technician to potentially even being someone in the office or a business owner. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the potential is there for those that want to work for it, and it's not going to be given to them. And sometimes these students, they think just a day ahead of them as opposed to a year. So they're going to think, well, I'm just going to go make more at this other place. But the potential for them to make, um, you know, a lot more is, is available to them, but they have to be willing to work for it. Yeah. And so let's I'm going to I'm going to throw some more stats out there just to kind of put them out there. And I don't want to talk too much numbers because it's, you know, everyone's listening. They're not viewing. Right. So it's a little different. But I would talk some numbers and then we'll go back a little bit about why CREF was formed, where it came from, and then what exactly you're doing with those thousand shops, right, or, or vocational centers. So what it sounds like today, or actually the, the, the numbers show from your, your survey, is that in the industry right now, there's about 40,000 shops in total, right, when we take the independent and the dealer shops put together, and roughly just under 200,000 technicians. And I believe that's coming from your from your data points there. But here was the interesting side is that, there's a 15, a little over 15% turnover rate. So you start looking at it, go, okay, 15%, that's, that's roughly 30,000 students. So, how, hey, guys, how are you getting the 14, right? At least right. hopefully we got some people that know math that are on, <laughs> that on us. Uh, but you know, when you start to go look at it, what your results and from your survey are showing is that about 8% of those are turnover within the trade, meaning they're just going from one collision group to the other collision group or shop, right? And then another uh, roughly 14,000 are just leaving in total. Is that fair based on what you guys have found out in your survey? Yep. And we hear that a lot in the industry when it comes to, you know, um, there is a, a, there's a panic going on in terms of, you know, shops and others that need help. Um, so them offering a quarter more an hour, a dollar more an hour, you know, and trying to get, you know, technicians from one place to another, it's, it's an unfortunate reality because people are kind of, you know, in order to do business, they need people to repair these vehicles. Um, so they're trying to do everything that they can, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's kind of the reality. So um, we do see a lot of, you know, whether technicians or maybe other positions, you know, they sometimes will go from business to business. Um, so what sure. we're trying to do is, you know, make sure these students are as well trained as possible while they're in school, which makes them more productive when they go into the industry. And that way they make more money for the business, but then they can also earn, earn more themselves. So hopefully they keep happy and, and stay with them where they're at if possible. Right, 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 right. Okay. So, you know, at this standpoint now, we understand, I believe, what CREF stands for and what CREF's trying to do, right? It's a foundation to, to gain dollars to be able to go out and support these learning centers. And we'll call them learning centers because not just vocational centers. It's the high schools and these programs to do a couple of things. And let's, let's get more specific. We're trying to address, you know, that 14,000. And, and here's, look, being a shop owner at one point in time, right? And I had a number of shops trying to get someone out of those, those schools. Basically, as soon as they got into my facility, I got to train them over, right? So the, the industry issues were not the fact that there's students that were available, but it's now they come into the marketplace and they realize, hey, I just want to be a painter because the, you know, the tools and equipment are so much less expensive, right? Let's face it, if I'm going to go fix these cars and the sophistication of these cars, at some point in time, I'm going to have a pretty elaborate set of tools, right? Shops don't provide, you know, the, all your tools that you need. Now, there are, don't get me wrong, you know, the welders and the frame racks and some of that stuff, right? That is provided, but you still need tools to take apart and dismantle these cars <laughs> and reassemble them. So there's a barrier right there, right? 
But it's also the fact that when they graduate from a lot of these places, I think that, that what, what you heard from shops was they're just not skilled enough when they, when they graduate. So one of the things you guys do is you work in partnership, right, with ICAR. Correct me where I'm wrong here because ICAR has got a curriculum. And you guys work with these schools. Talk, talk about the curriculum and what you guys are doing with these schools, right? Because it's great. And we'll, we'll give out your web address where people, if they need or would like to, because we'd love to get people to go support this, this foundation. Solera supports this foundation uh, heavily because we believe in, in, in going after in these, in the students. But talk to us a little bit about the curriculum and how you guys are helping these schools better prepare the students. Absolutely. So we were actually founded back in 1991, um, and we were founded under the name of the ICAR Education Foundation. And that, and that actually still is our legal name. And we were founded similar to ICAR, where basically a bunch of industry volunteers got together, and they basically, even back in 1991, recognized that the schools were in need of help. There was an aging workforce issue. So again, this is, you know, obviously many, many years ago, this was even an issue. Um, and what was basically formed was the ICAR Education Foundation, which initially from 1991 up until 2008, we were basically taking and distributing ICAR curriculum. Um, so ICAR, obviously, I'm sure many of your um, you know, listeners are, are aware, but the International Training Organization, they have industry recognized training. Um, and we were basically taking and distributing the ICAR curriculum to the high schools, to the colleges, so that the students. Um, in the ideal world, we're actually graduating with industry-recognized training, which would hopefully make them more productive, and it would hopefully address the issue that you brought up in terms of the need for these students to have those entry-level skill sets that would make them more productive and efficient when they came into into the industry. So we were doing that from 91 up until 2008, and then both ICAR and the foundation, again, two separate entities, the way I, I like to best describe it is McDonald's versus the the Ronald McDonald House. So we're kind of like the philanthropic arm, uh, work very closely together, but two separate entities. Um, it was decided that because ICAR was the ones that were developing the curriculum, updating it, maintaining it, it made sense for that curriculum distribution to be transitioned over to ICAR, which then allowed us to be the purely philanthropic organization that we are now. Um, and, and a great testament to the industry's generosity um, we, as a foundation, have gone from raising $300,000 in support in 2008, our first year as a philanthropic organization, to over $100 million in support since then. Um, if you can remember, wow. I actually joined on with the foundation in 2009. Um, that time period, 2008, 2009, if you remember the economic conditions, not the sure. best to be going out asking for anything. But this industry has, you know, leaps and bounds come through and not a lot of other you know, charities can state that kind of growth. Um, so it's a testament to the industry for their willingness to support us with monetary donations, tools, equipment, supplies, estimating software like you guys have donated. They realize that these schools have very limited budgets, but are, the expectations on these instructors to graduate qualified people, like you said, is enormous. So these instructors need help, and this industry has come into their aid. Brandon, and, and man, man, I appreciate what you're saying here. I want to pick up on this, but we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back after this, and we're going to continue on what you guys are doing, how you're spending that money you guys have, have taken in over those years, and, and get a little more detail to that. So we'll be right back after this short break. Solera Innovation Labs is a podcast produced by Solera, a global leader in data-driven solutions and services. Solera collects and translates complex data into actionable insights for automotive, identity, and property partners across 90 countries and counting. Learn more at solera.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. So welcome back, Brandon. Uh, after the short break, I want to continue the conversation. As we were talking before we went to break about where the ICAR Education Foundation that turned into CREP and that initial year started with its fundraising to where you guys have accumulated over the years, right, up to over $100 million in charitable donations to be used for these efforts. Let's talk a little bit about how you've used that money over those years uh, to impact these schools, what type of things that you're doing for them, where this money kind of gets spent with inside of that, as one of the things we want to do is not only tell everyone about that, but also try and get more people involved in supporting this cause because it's a huge need uh, for the industry. Sure. So 
Well, I would love to be able to tell you that that $100 million that we've been able to get from the industry and our supporters um, is all monetary. Um, it is a very good combination of both in-kind donations and monetary donations. So for the past couple of years, we've averaged anywhere between, I'd say, 10 to $12 million in total support. Um, and about roughly about 9 to $10 million of that is in the form of in-kind donations. And when I say in-kind, that means tools, equipment, supplies, parts, estimating software. Things that these programs and instructors need um, that otherwise they would have to be spending with their own budget. But by reaching out to our industry partners, um, for example, dealerships or body shops, they'll typically have a mountain of maybe spare or scrap parts that they can't use on customers' vehicles or that they get from customers' vehicles like bumpers, fenders, hoods, doors. Um, while it's trash to the body shops and the dealerships, that is gold for the instructors because they need those current model vehicle parts to be able to practice on with their students. So in that kind of you know, scenario, we're trying to keep these instructors who unfortunately are resulting to have to do dumpster diving in local businesses garbage to try to bring those parts out and get them for their schools. We're trying to bring some professionalism around it and help get these schools and businesses introduced to each other so that they can see who they're actually helping allow the businesses to come in, talk to the students about, you know, here is my business, here's a career path, here's job opportunities. And where the also side benefits that is, is when the administrators can see that local businesses have a valued interest in these students, it helps keep them off the chopping block because a lot of these programs, um, as any other technical programs, they're one of the more expensive programs to run. If you think of the consumables, the equipment, the supplies, it's not like a math class where you need 30 desks and a chalkboard or, you know, a screen. They're not cheap programs to run, uh, understandably, but... Well, you just need a calculator anymore for the math class. Right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but these instructors are being tasked... Some of these instructors have just $50 to spend per student for the entire year. Now, so let me you, ask this. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because, again, I come from a family of educators. And so you bring up something that I want to just... Maybe it's a sidebar, maybe it isn't, but where are they getting the instructors? Who's educating the instructors? How do we know that what they're teaching them is right. I get that they need to have the right components to go right and the right metals. I, I don't think there's too many high schools or both centers that are getting high strength steel in there and they're gonna start teaching on that. But I get when you gotta start looking at body work, basic body fill, dent repair, right? Those kind of things. Where where are these where are they getting the educators? In a lot of instances, these are former industry professionals um, who are kind of getting close to retirement and they're filling those positions within the schools or educational you know, uh, system. Um, in some rare instances, which we always like to see, there are some young instructors who are innovative. They know how to try to attract students and things like that. Um, so what we do, again, working with our industry partners, a lot of times it's, for example, paint companies. They have training seminars throughout you know, the various locations around the country. A lot of times we'll have, you know, a couple open seats, you know, we'll work together with them to where that they will not charge an instructor to come in and actually sit in that class just so they get up to date technical information about the industry so they can pass that knowledge down. Um, a lot of these instructors are also ICAR instructors. So they're teaching the latest and greatest when it comes to current technology and things like that. So they have that knowledge base that they're then hopefully passing down to the students. Um, so any opportunities they can, whether it's at maybe NACE when it was around or SEMA or any of the industry trade shows where there's training being held, we try to get as many of the local instructors as possible involved just so they're staying current so they've got that good knowledge base that these students are being brought up the right way while they're in school. Okay. So so that kind of addresses where these where the educators are coming from, and I and appreciate the answer because uh, I think that's just something that people want to they wanna know. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it's we got to train them, but Who's training these these young students? And so we'll, we'll, we'll wind back over to the donation where you the in-kind donations, uh, as I understand it, are really them, suppliers, other people offering goods um, for these schools to be able to utilize in the programs. And those things could be anywhere from the, from the paint uh, for, you know, the, the body fillers, the, the glues, the caulks, the adhesives, all the things that are necessary and kind of run in that classroom. Is that fair to say? You know, sandpaper, tape, all that stuff is extremely expensive to go you know, put in there, especially when people are, you know, how many students you have in there trying to work on something? It's not, you know, that stuff doesn't grow on trees, right? It's, it's just an expensive part of, of the shop. Is that fair to say on the exactly. in-kind donations? 
I've got instructors that are calling me up. I can tell that they've got tears in their eyes because there's one company when it comes to even something as basic as safety glasses. So MCR Safety out of Memphis, they donate 50,000 pairs of safety glasses to us every year. So we can pretty much cover all of the you know school's needs when it comes to even something as basic as safety glasses. But because we were able to provide that to the schools, obviously important for the students to stay safe. It's one less thing that those instructors have to spend their money on and they can put those you know, monetary, the small monetary budget that they do have can go towards other things as well. Um, so we, we are engaging the schools to find out and kind of provide us with kind of like an inventory list of what they have when it comes to tools, equipment, supplies. And then we try to fill in those gaps and or replace tools and equipment that they have that is just outdated. It's fairly, be, you know, it's fairly working, but then they've got what they need to be able to provide that quality technical education that the, uh, the industry is looking for from these students. Awesome. Uh, it's, it's just so awesome. I mean, you know what? Coming again, coming from a family of educators and and coaching and doing that stuff. That when you when you can hear that, what it impact it has for those students in those schools, it's tremendous, right? So those so those are the in kind. So you got a lot of that going in kind. So then you got the monetary side, and there's my understanding a couple different ways that people can do things monetarily, right? By just writing a check to be a part of this. Talk to us about that, and then how those funds are used. Sure, absolutely. So each year um, we provide. When it comes to monetary donations, it's anything from student scholarships. Um, obviously, there's some tuition. There can be sometimes tuition barriers, um, financial barriers that these students um, are facing to be able to stay within school. So we're helping out with uh, tuition needs, um, tool and equipment grants. So while we might not be able to get everything donated on the in-time side, we sometimes do have to purchase items from companies who will nine times out of 10 give us a pretty significant discount because they know it's going to a school or educational facility. Um, local companies, the kind of the big thing now, um, which has kind of been interesting and it's kind of picked up a lot of steam is local businesses sponsoring uniforms for the local students. So they look professional while they're in school. Um, oh, how cool you, is that? Right. I mean, so when I had my shops, I could actually have sponsored the local school and they'd all have my shop's name on their, on their shirt every day when they're going in the work. Exactly. And we've actually heard, cool. uh, to your point, yes, your company's name, your logo is on there that the students We've heard from instructors that the students hate taking them off. Um, and out of the 100 plus million that we've been able to provide to the schools, instructors have told us that the uniforms of all things have made the biggest impact on these programs because the students feel professional, they look professional, they're treated with a new level of respect by guests, visitors, administrators. Um, and it makes them, you know, it makes it look like a professional learning environment. Um, something similar to that, Don, that we've we tried an initiative this summer is if we're going to attract the best students to these programs, they need to look like professional learning environments. If you've seen some of these programs, mm. it's to no fault of the instructor because they've got limited budgets like I've been talking about. But if you can just look at the floors, some of these programs have been open 30, 40, 50 years. Their floors have not been touched. And sometimes you think you might need a tetanus shot before you leave because of how dirty and, you know, kind of pretty much like dungeons. So working together with our friends at Rustolium, who's based corporately up here in the Chicago suburbs, uh, we're getting local businesses to adopt local schools and provide them with brand new epoxy floors. So the schools put some skin in the game where they commit to being able to grind and prep their current floors. And depending on the school's square footage, that determines kind of what the sponsorship amount is. But it basically covers the floor um, cost and helps that program look professional. And if you could see the before and after pictures, um, it, it is night and day to what these programs look like. And if we're going to want the best to come to this program and to this industry, we have to attract the best. And sometimes it even starts with just making sure it looks like a professional learning environment. Well, it's, 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 I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things, you know, with the 28 stores that I had, every one of our facilities, the floors were painted. And people kind of looked at me like, why would you paint the floors? And one, it, it, it's very professional, right? Yep. Uh, two, this is where your technicians, that are the people working on your car, they're they're sitting on the floor, they're laying on the floor, they're crawling around on the floor. You know, the car's not lifted up in the air, you know, super high where they can stand. Or You know what I mean? It, it, people don't really understand what happens in the back of that body shop. When I go dismantle your car, yeah, I can jack it up a little bit, but I'm laying underneath it. Around. So we did, we painted the floors. We also uh, scrubbed them. We had these little, I call them little Zambonis, right? That's the hockey side of me. And we would bring this in and we machine scrub the floors every day. Right. And the technician was my point being is that you got to create an environment that they understand is good for them. And yep. when you have it for the students as well, they're starting to go see that it's a 
this isn't, you know, I guess when I first got into the industry, my vision of a collision center or a body shop was um, almost the old school junkyard, which is a bad terminology, right? Uh, the recyclers, but you go really back and it was a like a dog tied to a chain protecting the cars in the back so you can't get through the fence and just not a good image, right? And I think once the students start to see truly what these professional facilities look like and the career path, it has a significant impact. I mean, so the things that you're saying are, are to me, uh, hopefully the, the listeners are, are writing down all this and, and wanting to go to, to, to your website, collisioneducationfoundation.org and, and donate because look, just the uniforms and the floors being done create an environment where these students start to understand that this is, this is a career, right? So you, you are worth a lot. You you know what I mean? You're not just thrown into a program because we have no other place to put you. Exactly. And that's where, you know, our ability to help connect people. So I understand, Don, if you're in Chicago, if you want to give to the foundation, you maybe want to see where your support is going to be reinvested back locally. That might actually affect you or you might, you know, might be a neighborhood of yours that you want to make sure that that support is helping. Um, so the, the opportunities like the uniforms, the floors, even tool grants and things like that, we can help one connect the local businesses with the schools so that they mm-hmm. actually are familiar with each other if they're not already. Um, but then otherwise, you know, it's not just about writing a check and being done. We want to make sure that you are kind of being invested into that school so that you are seeing the quality of students that hopefully makes that, that is employable once they actually do exit the program. And we always hear stories about, you know, ex-shop owner. I tried hiring from the school, you know, five years ago and that student I hired was a disaster. And my response is understand, respect it. You know, that's, that's what happened in the past. Now, what we either can do is let's get you involved and so that you are talking with this instructor so the product that's coming out is to it's meeting your needs. Otherwise, we're just going to be arguing about this for another five years because of an experience you had five years ago. So yeah. it's, it's that local support and investment is important. Yeah, and, you know, when I had um, – and, and look, we'll go back when it was um, the Our, ICAR Education Foundation, uh, when I had my shops before it turned into crap, we – sponsored a lot. And there was a, a, a local vocational center called Thornton Fractional. Uh, believe it or not, my, my dad was a teacher. There's two high schools, uh, a Thornton Fractional North and a Thornton Fractional South. And they fed, both those schools fed their vocational center. Um, and so I got to know the guy that ran the, the body shop program. And I remember us uh, taking on and expanding and growing to another location. And in the process, there was a, a booth. It was a good booth. It wasn't a, a terrible paint booth, but it, we were upgrading all the equipment. And so we, we actually donated the booth uh, to the school. And, it, and so when you start to think about the in-kind donations and what's going on, it's not just painting the floor and, and making it look pretty and putting the uniforms on, but they have to have the right equipment in there to, to be able to, to learn and be educated properly. And let's face it, some of the paint booths in these vocational centers and schools, are they're not of the quality that they are today. And you're definitely not going to get the airflow to start using some of the, the waterborne, water-based tanks that are out there, uh, right? So it was just kind of neat when you start to go look at it and you go visit the school and the students. And look, we tried recruiting students out of there. It's a tough program. And that's sure. where I think you guys have donated the curriculum. And when they can graduate and have some ICAR accreditation, right, you can start to look at where – where can I utilize the student? I think when you start, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brandon, but when you start to go look at the way the industry has evolved, especially with some of these large shop owners, you know, they're five, six, seven, eight, ten shops. They start to change the way or the methodology of doing the repair, meaning they're going to start to, I guess, for the people that know or don't know, it's blueprinting. Right? So the car comes in, it's scheduled. I'm going to bring it in, I'm going to tear it down. And someone's going to tear that apart in the process, work with, someone who completes the estimate to, to make sure that they have the exact blueprints to fix that vehicle. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is where I think these students, as they graduate from these programs become vitally important, right? They have enough that they can go in there and they understand what they need to go do. Would you agree with that starting to be the premise of where these students can go? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I understand that the instructor is tasked with, you know, providing a pretty broad kind of general overview of the collision education and collision industry whenever they've got them in their schools. And some instructors, unfortunately, have them for just, you know, less than an hour per day. So their ability to get into any kind of depth on many things is pretty limited. 
But also in the snapshot that you were referencing before on the very back page, we asked the industry, what are the top, I think it's 15 to 20 entry-level skill sets that you are looking for from a, um, a new technician, entry-level staff? Mm-hmm. So it, from the, the most you know, requested down to the bottom. And another thing that we're doing is you know, highlighting that list to the instructors across the country saying, if you want to make your students more employable, because some of these instructors are graded by the number of students they actually place within their respective industries. If you want your students to be more employable, productive, and they stay within the industry, this is what the industry is telling us that they want from you. So providing a general overview about the industry and the different types of, you know, welding, you know, when the student walks into a shop on day one, they're probably not going to be welding on a customer's car. Should they know a little bit about it? Yep. Are they tested at like Skills USA competitions? Yep. But make sure that they're great at these entry level skill sets that the industry is telling us are yeah. needed. That's what where the focus should be on to make them more employable. And it's interesting you say it because you know I have I have your 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 marketing piece your your survey results up and prep for paint still number one R and R bolted parts. So when we talk about that blueprinting and the dismantling of a car, R and R bolted parts. So dismantling that car is number two, and, and they're really not much of a difference there. And then it gets into being able to do some basic dent repair, detailing, and plastic repair. So when we start to go look at the and the plastics on the car are changing in some of the OEM uh, procedures uh, and their positions change a little bit of what gets repaired from a plastic perspective. But it's still, those are the kind of skills these students are looking for. And that's part of your curriculum that you provide, correct? I mean, these are the things as they go through that they're, they're going to have knowledge of and they're going to come out with some iCar uh, class points, right, so that they can start to work for and, and help that shop become iCar Gold platinum, whatever it may be. Is that fair to say with these schools as well? Exactly. And it saves the business money to where, you know, you hire someone that already has the iCar points. It's less money that you have to spend sending that person back to training. So there's a value there as well. In addition, just having the, the, you know, basic knowledge that they should have when it comes to, you know, coming into the industry. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Brandon, I'm going to try and start to go through and wrap up a few things. And what I want to do is we start to kind of get down to the end of our time. I want to talk a little bit about what you guys have done kind of go out and touch the industry. So we talk about the number of facilities and schools that you're going after, right? And the, and the amount of money and the in-kind donation versus the monetary. So all of that stuff's there. But one of the things that it really kind of touches me, what you guys do is you guys do these career fairs. I want you to talk about what you're doing with the career fairs, how many you have, what kind of students you get in, what kind of volume you have. Talk to us about that. I don't think many people know that you guys do career fairs. Well, hopefully after this podcast, I will, though. That's been right. <laughs> exactly. So we, we were able to provide, you know, like I said before, 100 plus million to all the schools and students across the country, which is great. But if we're not helping to get these students placed within the industry to address that issue of an aging workforce and the need for entry-level technicians, we'd obviously be missing, be missing the bigger points. Um, and supporters of ours would understandably be questioning, why are we giving you guys the support if we're not helping to see the end result of people going into the industry. So back in actually 2015, we started uh, creating what we called, they were just regular collision career fairs. So we'd go into a particular market. The first one was down in Dallas, Texas. Um, at the time, it was uh, the band, um, Berkshire Hathaway actually closed down one of their dealerships in the Dallas area. They cleared out, I think it was a 50,000 square foot dealership. And they basically working together with us created a career fair where we had all sorts of different types of companies there. Body shops, dealerships, insurance companies, paint companies, a lot of different dealer, um, different companies there. Um, and what started from that, we've actually now grown to expanding beyond just having collision students because we were going into, like I said, a major market and inviting all local high school and college collision students to come attend the event uh, and then also having local and national employers there as well. We received... Um, great initial feedback about the event, but it was to the point and it showcases to what need this industry has. We were hearing from employers saying, Brandon, I don't care if it's collision, auto service, heavy duty, diesel, let's bring a bigger group of students to these events and showcase what maybe some different career paths that they aren't thinking or are aware of because of the, the industry and the need that there is. So now we've turned these into transportation career fair events and these events, which used to average maybe two to 300 students per event, we have some that have over a thousand students, depending on the wow. market too, uh, and the number of schools that are in those markets. But we're have, averaging right about 20 uh, career fairs per year. We have roughly, I wouldn't say about maybe 12 to 13 in the spring semester, 
and then eight to 10 in the fall semester. Um, and next year in 2020, we're pledging to have a career fair event in the top 25 markets that have technician needs across the country. So if you think of a major city, Chicago, wow. Dallas, Houston, you know, that those top city markets, we're going to be working together with our industry partners. We work very closely with the ICAR volunteer committees um, to help be kind of like that grassroots, you know, kind of marketing and kind of distribution of information to get information out, hold the events typically at schools because it's a nice neutral ground. Um, but we have the students register electronically for these events, which means we capture contact and resume information. If the students and schools register with us at least 30 days out from the event, we provide them with brand new Cintas technician shirts. So they come to the events meeting employers looking professional. Um, and even beyond that, one kind of exciting thing that we started this past year and looking to expand on is working together with the Colorado Auto Dealers Association. We actually had our Denver career fair on the Denver auto show floor. Wow. Was, that was cool. That it was, it was eye opening to, to, say at least just because we had about 300 students which is about average for that market but i literally because we were having it with general attendees as well i literally got to see parents pushing their kids into the career <laughs> hey, get out of my basement get yourself a job here's people that want to hire you and take advantage of this opportunity so while we don't have millions of dollars spent on advertising and a national campaign to try to attract um you know parents to understand what we're doing when we do events like that working together with local partners we were able to get out in front of parents. We're already starting to talk about next year's events, but we've also heard from other dealership associations who said, hey, I heard what you guys did with Denver. Let's do this on my car show floor. And, you know, it helps showcase what's going on within the industry to those of the events. That's awesome. So, hey, I'm going to bring up a couple. So you got St. Louis coming up on, um, what, is it September 27th that we have? Yep. Yep. And then Detroit, Michigan coming up in, in October, right? Early October. Yep. Uh, and then Dallas. And so you're going back to back weeks here. So in in October, you guys are hosting what it looks like um, was it six five five career fairs. So you're going Detroit, Dallas, Northern California, Southern California, right? Uh, yeah. And then there's another one that you have all of, and then you have South Carolina, all in that month. Is that a I mean, that's a lot for you guys to go put on. How does someone get involved in this? You know, we got people listening from all different types. And because this is transportation, if I'm an employer, do I just reach out to you? How do they find out how to get there so they can go try to recruit? And then if I'm a school listening, how do I get my students there? Um, it, it doesn't matter if it's a high school. It doesn't have to be a vocational center. If you got anyone who's interested in this career path, how do they know? How do I get them this information? Where do they go? Go to our website. CollisionEducationFoundation.org. Um, just your contact information. Um, what's important to note um, is that we are only a full-time staff of seven, so we're very lean in our operations, which allows <laughs> us to state that we return 90 cents of every dollar back to the schools that's donated, which is important to state as we are a, a 501c3 charity. But we work very closely with our industry partners to help make all these events possible. Um, but get in contact with us. We can make sure that you get signed up for one or several particular events. There's kind of different levels of participation. So if you just want a, a table at the event and a copy of the student resume database, you know, at that one price, if you want to kind of upgrade where you have breakout sessions. So we rotate all the students through a, basically you get a five to seven minute commercial time to be able to talk with the, the students at the event and get your logo on the shirts that we're distributing. There's kind of different options. Um, and if you're a school, obviously let us know so that we can kind of get you into our system so that we can take advantage or you can take advantage as a school of all the different donation opportunities, whether it's, you know, donated Solera um, estimating software or safety glasses or whatever. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the right contact information for the school. So when different opportunities arise, you know, we're getting it to the right person. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so look, one of the things that I want everyone to know that if you're um you're an employer looking for students or not even looking for, looking for technicians, right? Be active, get involved when, when these guys are coming into town, but also get on their website, get involved with this organization. They're doing great things to kind of help our industry fill a gap. That's not going away, right? Brandon, this is not going away. We got to continue to go as a, as a group, as an industry kind of go after it. But what I really do like about the career fairs, and this is what kind of helps, is that it's transportation, right? So it's collision, it's auto services, it's heavy duty. It's, you know, you have this vast array of students that are coming in, in here. It's not just on the collision side, but it's, it's 
a lot more on the, just the automotive verticals in general, right? Absolutely. All right. Well, so we want to get everyone. To, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say the more, particip- more participation, the better. The schools, the instructors, they greatly need your help. And I can't thank you guys enough for one, your continued support and the opportunity to be um, on this podcast with you. Well, look, Brandon, before we sign off, I want to thank you for taking the time, number one. Two, I want everyone to understand that Solera is a, a proud sponsor and, and in heavily involved in this, not just in the craft, but also in ICAR. But we really appreciate you taking time today. Look, people don't realize what you're doing and what's out there. And I think the more we can help get the, the word about craft, the Collision Repair Education Foundation, what it does, the better it is, the more people can get involved and really start to, to help this this cause. So, look, thank you again for your time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And please be listening for our next episodes of the Slayer Innovation Lab coming soon. I'm Don Mikewood. You guys have a great day. Solera Innovation Labs is a podcast produced by Solera, a global leader in data-driven solutions and services. Solera collects and translates complex data into actionable insights for automotive, identity, and property partners across 90 countries and counting. Learn more at Solera.com or find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.